here we go. We're going to get to tonight's presentation and uh, the introduction. Okay. I don't really have an introduction. I spent like, God, how many hours? Ten hours together? This guy's good. He is really good, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear the presentation. I requested an executive summary from him, which he was gratefully provided and put together, and that's been on the email, so hopefully you can... Okay, let's, let's just move on. Okay, so uh, anyway, what I would like to do is I'd like to introduce you to GR Mobley, and he will tell you more about himself as the presentation progresses. Big hand. So I repeat myself when under stress, I repeat myself when under stress. So we're good, we're working. And I don't see what I need to see. There's something I need to see up there. Is this right? This is my clicker. <clears throat> Before I really get started into this meaty presentation, I wanted to, and it is meaty, um, and I'm going to really breeze through this as fast as I possibly can, but I wanted to thank the Northwest Grassroots for having me and uh, giving me an opportunity to really fire hose a lot of people tonight. Um, I do have my books here, and the majority of the proceeds of the sale of the book will actually go to the Northwest Grassroots. So I'm not really going to make that much money on it. I don't like doing book tours and peddling, and as a matter of fact, when I do things like this, I always give the proceeds to the host organization because I know that they're sitting there and I'm just going to be making them sick by you know, going through the Constitution and how bad it really is. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I do have a radio show in Spokane. It's on AM 1230, and I'm right now during your evening commute from 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, and hopefully we'll be growing that into uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays as well within the next few months with sponsorship support and so forth. So without any further ado, what I have here is the irrefutable argument for Republic Review. Republic Review is a term that I came up with with another constitutional scholar that is a play on judicial review because the Supreme Court says that they want to have the power to be able to pull in throughout the Republic a case that they think that might be worthy of their view even though it's outside of the constitutional jurisdiction. But Republic Review actually is an inherent right, and we are a republic, and the republic has the authority, and I will get into this, in actually uh, overseeing the Constitution. So, let me turn myself on, and here we go. Oh. So I have some fundamental premises. Reasonable people, equally informed, seldom disagree. The problem is that middle part equally informed. We have a lot of people that don't necessarily have the same level of information. The second premise is knowledge is power. I think everybody understands and as soon as you start understanding what you need to be doing, then you become a little more powerful and knowledge is also dangerous. And so the third part of this is that, and this is a, basically a phrase from Madison, and I think it was common knowledge back in the framers' days, that people are the fountain of political power. And so tying these three things together, becoming equally informed and becoming knowledgeable in the right ways of truly understanding the actual academic applications of the Constitution and getting back into what the framers gave us will help us concentrate our power as the fountain of power because the people are the fountain of power. And the problem with our representation, if any of them are still left, that are back in DC or back, not in DC, back in Olympia and DC if Kathy was here, is that we redirect them in so many different ways. So I want to go through this, and I want you to keep this in mind, that there are so many distractions that are causing our problems, that we're not focused and succinct in the message that we want our representatives to save us from federal tyranny. So if you didn't know, the Constitution was written for and by the states. It didn't just come up from the Potomac and it didn't just come from a good rainfall out in the field. The states sent delegates and the states had to ratify this. 
And so one of the unique things about our Constitution is that the sovereignty was actually evenly distributed. The majority of the power obviously rests with the people, but the states are really the overseers, and we're the ones that are supposed to be controlling the states. So if you can grasp that, then Article 7 should make sense if you know what Article 7 is, it's the ratification process. Article 7 identifies who the stakeholders are of the Constitution. Who was it? It was the states. And the 13 original states are the real stakeholders and all states that came in basically became equal stakeholders in that same Constitution. So Washington is a part of the stakeholders and owners of this Constitution. It's not the federal government, it's not the Supreme Court. They are the highest authority and sovereigns in the world over the world's greatest government. Do you fathom that? I hope so. So if you understand this ratification clause, which is a part of Article 7, ratification is the official and formal acceptance of a contract. Basically, it's pointing out that this Constitution is a contract. Madison said this. Jefferson said this. All the framers interchanged compact, constitution, and contract. They were interchangeable several times. In many of their writings, they referred to it as compacts and contracts. That being said, the ratification process didn't just happen in a bubble, nor was it an up and down vote where everybody just voted, yeah, we're going to accept this. Guess what? In contract law, if you understand um, what, what happens when you're negotiating a contract, the negotiations of that contract actually become legally binding. If you understand that I say that this line means this, and you, sir, have given me this contract that you've written, and you say, no, this is exactly what it means, and you write that down, that's legally binding to what that contract means. And that's exactly what happened during these ratification debates. But I'll get into that a little sooner. But what the Constitution actually did do in these two things, these two bullets here, at the very bottom, is it delegated very specific powers to the federal government. This is all they can do. Nothing more. This is what we delegate to you to do. That second one, that second bullet, is what basically the states have retained. Basically giving them supremacy on all things not delegated. Healthcare, not delegated. The states are supreme in that. Everything that we really understand that the federal government is doing, over 80%, as I say in my executive summary, is unconstitutional. These are the delegated powers. I think it's really important I put them up here. We're just going to fly through these. I'm not going to read these. And at the very bottom, you'll notice the blue words will denote the um, commonly used usurpations that the federal government uses, or as, or as far as the clauses, Commerce Clause, General Welfare Clause, Necessary and Proper Clause, and the Supremacy Clause. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to say this at the very end, that all of these slides I'm putting up will be in PDF format on my website. And you know, if Northwest Grassroots has a website as well, but I have reclaimingtherepublic.org and mobiustrippress.org. They'll all point to the, uh, where you can get these. And if you follow me on Facebook, I'll announce it as soon as I get these things up. So that way you can actually go through this and you know, garner more because I'm not reading these for you. And I don't have the time because I, I understand opportunity costs and I really appreciate you being here. So this is page one of the delegated powers. This is article one, section eight. Here's page two of the delegated powers. Oversight is an inherent vehicle in a contract. If you have a subcontractor that is failing to execute as you've told them and they've taken privileges or latitude in the contract, you have the power to go in and say, we did not give you this or delegate these powers to you and you can actually kick them out or you can get them back into the framework if they want to behave well. That's the power the states have. And in the ratification, as I said this before, 
the mediations, negotiations, and everything that they clarified are legally binding. So here's why John Marshall did not want to have these things as a part of their standard. He never cited the ratification debates. Why? Because he knew it was said because he was at the Virginia ratification debate and it would have tied his hands to saying, well, I guess the federal government isn't supreme in these particular cases or in all things as he did later and I'll get into that. So therefore, the, uh, the states are the principal stakeholders of the Constitution, and they have the ability to actually step in at any point in time because it is inherent of oversight and control in any contract. If you are the stakeholder, you can step in at any point and take over. So the modification process is another thing that supports this. Who has the power to make any changes to the Constitution? Can the Supreme Court come along and say, we want to grant the ability to, to give abortions. No, they can't. It's well outside their jurisdiction. They don't have the power to make those changes, but they do it because we've been told that they can. Marshall created these precedents a long time ago, but the Article 5 process clearly states who is the arbiter, or I should say, who is the final arbiter of what becomes constitutional and what isn't constitutional. It's the states. It requires three-fourths of the states to allow something to be changed to the Constitution. Not the President, not Congress, nor the Supreme Court. The states have that kind of power. So if we move forward real quick, and I set up these facts of precedence, if you look at what the federal government did right out the gate, right after the Constitution was signed, they set up a precedence of obeying the Constitution. Imagine that. They actually lived by it because they amended the Constitution 12 times while, they, while the framers were still alive. And as a matter of fact, if you look at this 12th Amendment, the 12th Amendment, or I'm, I'm sorry, is it the 12th? Yeah, it's the 12th Amendment because that was the Jefferson-Adams debate over the Electoral College because it took 80 votes to finally get the president seated uh, to be Jefferson. And so they changed the Electoral College. So they made a minute change to Article 2, and they amended the Constitution for that. Guess what? We're not even following that because Congress took it upon themselves to say, we can create statutes and regulations now and change how we do our Electoral College. And that's why we're not doing it per of Article 11, or I should say, per the 12th Amendment. So let me give you a little pitch on the, our federal government. If everybody doesn't know, the president is the executive and he's supposed to faithfully execute the laws. Not create laws, execute. He has, a, he has the biggest stake in foreign policy and to me that's one of the most important things is what is his foreign policies. Congress is supposed to legislate and create the laws that are pertinent to the enumerated powers, not create new powers. And the best part is the Supreme Court is supposed to be the guardians. They're supposed to protect the Constitution from encroachments, from uh, encroachments from the legislation or encroachments from the executive. And if you read the Federalist Papers, one would think that these guys were holy men, that they would have been holy men, but they're not, and they're obviously very corruptible. Bottom line, the states have, and it's incredible that the states have this ability, and I, as I say it down here at the very bottom, this contractual authority that the states possess cannot be usurped, delegated, or abdicated voluntarily or by force. It has to be changed per the Constitution and the constitutional process, and the states are asleep at the wheel. So the Constitution has been under attack for a long time, and in 1803 was the first time by the judiciary with judicial review. The first time by Congress that was really egregious was 18, um, 1817 with, no, it was, yeah, it was 1817 with Madison, I'm sorry. I've just got all these other numbers. 1849 was the year that they actually successfully created an unconstitutional department called the Department of Interior which is the BLM. We got a problem with those guys? Okay, so that is an unconstitutional department. And in 1829 was the first time the president really stepped over his bounds and actually persecuted people such as the Trail of Tears. This was Andrew Jackson when he actually started reigning with some tyranny. He got some things right, but he was our first living king, overstepping his bounds, and we've had nothing but kings since. So the judiciary has used 
these four clauses to usurp the state's powers. And if you go through the language of the Constitution, the language of the Federalist Papers, the Constitutional Convention, ratification debates, and so forth, it does not jive with what John Marshall said. The four clauses, in actuality, really, and as a matter of fact, let me jump to this Commerce Clause, which is the third one down. There's this thing called regulate, and people read in the commerce, what, they're supposed to regulate commerce? No. Back then, the definition of regulate meant put in good order. That was the common use, and as a matter of fact, they didn't have heavy regulations and heavy-handed tactics of government. If you look, they were a laissez-faire, not involved at all, unless there was a direct dispute between one state or another, or in contracts and so forth. Um, as far as the necessary and proper clause and all of these other ones, there's a real good document I'm going to get to real, real quick here. But these are the seven landmark cases. I believe it's seven up there, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So, so there's seven. I know that a few people point to eight and nine. But these to me are the real seven landmark cases that John Marshall used to create rulings that what he ended up doing was created unconstitutional footings for people to come in later because he injected precedence in case law. The Constitution does not allocate precedence in case law. Do you understand that? So in other words, because this happened or somebody said something, we, build, we believe we can make a decision in favor of doing this. No, it's either in the Constitution or not, and that's how they're supposed to read it. There's no case law allowed in the Constitution. And then if you read the ratification debates, they were very clear. Had that been a part of the Constitutional Convention and the ratification debates, I'm telling you, the 13 states would have rejected it because they would have recognized that the judiciary would have had way too much power to be able to start moving decisions and amending the Constitution or making things constitutional. So in 1817, this is a very interesting story. Madison was just getting out of his presidency. He had a conversation sometime in late January, early February the, with his colleagues from Congress, because he worked in Congress for a long time. And they wanted to know what, he, what they could do to create a hallmark bill that would, you know, just make his, you know, his legislation, right? Like Obamacare, his legislation. And so he said, you know, the one thing that this nation really needs is the ability to move commerce from the hinterland to the ports and back and forth. And if we could move commerce, commerce more efficiently, that we would be an economic power that no one in the world could reckon with. And he was absolutely correct. They went across those the aisle or they went down you know Pennsylvania's Avenue and they created their legislation they came back with what was called the bonus bill and this bonus bill was vetoed by Madison and they were really insulted by this fact and you know what the Madison Monument is in Washington the Library of Congress <laughs> that's the edifice for the father the guy we call the father of the Constitution because obviously they were a little upset um, but the fact is, is that if you read this one veto, and I say it right here, this is likely the most powerful one-page document written since the of dawn and since now to this day for this republic because he squashes these four clauses in this one veto. He basically says that the supremacy clause, the commerce clause, the necessary and proper clause, and the general welfare and defense clauses only pertain to the enumerated powers within the Constitution. These are not portals to granting new powers. This is Madison saying this. And so I invite you to read this if you haven't read my executive summary and all the citations. This is in my first book as well. So bottom line, they weren't supposed to do this. Well, they tried again in 1822 with James Monroe, and then they tried again in 1830 with Andrew Jackson, and both of those presidents vetoed what was going to be the Department of Transportation. All three said you have to amend the Constitution if you want to have a Department of Transportation. Well, seems to me, folks, we've got one. Please show me the amendment. We have two framers and a, you know, a, a Johnny-come-lately President Jackson, but still, we got the precedents, and they said that we had to do this, so who's right? Who has the, who, who has the accuracy on this? Who's nader on this point, right above the accuracy on this? And I'm going to tell you, it's Madison, because he knew. So if you remember that government picture that I had before, 
those top lists up there, if you look, interior, agriculture, those are all unconstitutional powers that were created via these clauses. Interesting. None of them have gone through the Article 5 process. And as a matter of fact, if you notice, there's a little blue box above the form of government. That is supposed to be the state's oversight to make sure that nothing gets created to weigh upon the republic. It has to be done within the confines of the Constitution, which is that kind of beige area that I have the Constitution barrier. So for them to create anything, it has to be within the Constitution, and they didn't do that. So in a macro, we have 15 executive departments, 585 agencies, offices, blah, 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 blah. Over 80% of them are unconstitutional. Now, I don't know if that's arbitrary, but to me, that definitely qualifies as federal tyranny. We didn't grant them these powers through the constitutional process. So the problem is really not about immigration. The problem isn't about abortion and all of these other education. You name it, you call it what you want if, what, if it's your passion. But I'm telling you the problem is truly compliance to the Constitution. All of these problems that everybody's passionate about, remember I was talking about that fountain of power. There's so many people that are caught up on whatever their passion of the day is or the problem du jour. The problem du jour should be one thing and one thing alone, compliance to the Constitution. That's it. If we focus on that, all these other problems are going to go away. And this is our monster, and there's the focus. If we start focusing on the monster instead of these little arms, because they've truly created a leviathan. So I think this is a great picture to kind of show all the different arms that they've grown that have been unconstitutional. If any of those are up there that are your passion, then I would basically say, Let's redirect your passion and focus down to the, what the real problem is, and that's the monster. If you want to get rid of these things, you have to kill the monster. So the Constitution is very clear. It gave the sole responsibility to the states. The framers knew exactly what they were doing. And again, it's not given to the president and is not given to Congress and it's not given to the Supreme Court. So what do you do when a contract is being violated? And again, who's that ultimate authority that we can go to? There you go. It's an audit. It's a contract. It's inherent. We can audit the Constitution that simple. As a matter of fact, I floated this out, and if you listen to my radio show today, I talked to Dr. Weil, who's the Dean of Honors for Middle Tennessee University, and he's the Dean of the Political Science Department. And he doesn't necessarily like my idea because he's an academic, and I, I, I have a lot of respect for this guy. He really understands the ins and outs and knows a lot more than me, but he doesn't argue the fact that this, the states don't have this power. He just do, would not want to see this because he believes that there would be an anarchy, um, there'd be anarchy that might follow from this. Or there may be other problems, or there's precedents and so forth. But again, giving him the due respect of being an academic, I, I, I give him that. But there's lots of others that don't like this as well because they think, oh, we can't do this. We've got to educate everybody. So I'll get into how we do this, but this is what we really have to do. We must audit the Constitution, getting all the states involved, because we've got to remember, it's our contract. So conducting an audit, um, an audit is one of those things that we can actually get down by going, or uh, the basis of the audit is one of those things that we just basically have to follow the Constitution. Was the Constitution followed in creating any new roles, responsibilities, and powers? So we have to go through all of these existing roles, responsibilities, and powers and define that's constitutional, that's not constitutional. So here's the 12 executive departments that have been created since the framers created the first three, the defense, treasury, and state. So here's the other 12. Was the Article 5 process followed for them to have these delegated powers, are these usurped? Well, you won't find any amendments, folks. 
So the key points to remember is Article 7 truly defined who the stakeholders were of the Constitution. It is in the Constitution who had to buy in. It had nothing to do with corporations or the federal government because it didn't exist. It required the states. Article 5 gives the states the power to dictate what is constitutional, what isn't. And because they passed these 12 departments under our nose and we've been sleeping at the wheel, I'm just here waking you up. I'm just here stating the obvious. We have the ability to challenge these as the republic as we move forward. And so auditing the contract again is the obvious thing that we have to do. And it can start with one state. One. So eventually all states, once, an, once one state gets this going, all states are going to get into the game because they have skin in the game. And the audit is only an administrative function. So those of you who think that the exerting state power will lead to a very decimating thing to the Constitution, not at all. If you understand what an audit is, an audit is to protect that document, protect the contract, right? And so when I talk about a convention for republic review, I'm not talking about a convention that's going to amend, write, rewrite, make any modifications. It's basically an audit of looking at what the Constitution says and what you're doing and going, you're not supposed to be doing these things. You're going to have to cease and desist. These are going to have to come back to the states. And the states will be the sovereigns and decide what they want to do. If you want a veteran's affair, then we have to amend the Constitution. As a veteran, I would love to see that become constitutional. But it's unconstitutional. Bottom line. So we have to strictly go against the norm of accepting what they're doing because they're supreme. And we have to start looking in the paradigm that we are the supremes over whatever is constitutional and what isn't. So when we get one state to initiate the con or this audit and this convention process. What it does is it's going to establish authenticity and reestablish the authority that the states have in this constitution. You get that? They're going to reestablish their authority once again because the federal government has basically taken the role that they are the supreme in all things. Read the Washington State Constitution. It says that the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Then why is it that the state of Washington is following all these unconstitutional things that aren't in the U.S. Constitution? Hmm. So when we get the first state, it's going to call upon all the other states. And as a matter of fact, I, folks, this has happened before. You know who did this the first time in trying to call an audit? Anybody read my executive summary? Madison and Jefferson with the Sedition Acts tried to stand up and called all the states to say this is a constitutional violation of the First Amendment. They cannot regulate speech. And that's exactly what they did with the Sedition Act. And so they sent out an appeal to all the states saying, please join us in admonishing and setting the federal government right. Well, the other states didn't want to play along. That wasn't their fault at this point. But we cannot afford not to sit on our hands anymore. And I'm telling you, there's more than enough states that when they get this and when they start cogitating, ruminating, and, and digesting this information, why is it that, you know, they haven't started this sooner? The convention in auditing the Constitution is what I call Republic Review. It is pulling the Republic together and reviewing that document and ensuring that what's being performed and what's being done is within the purview of that document, period. I think it's a logical marketing concept, Republic Review. Again, it is not a constitutional convention. It is not a convention of states. These two terms, convention of states and or a constitutional convention, requires an Article 5 application of the states to Congress. The states don't need to apply when they want to enforce their contract. All they need to do is say, you know what, we're done. You're, you're running us into the ditch on, on debt. You're doing all of these tyrannical things to us. You're taking our property. We're done. We're going to audit you. Prove to me today that you actually have the authority from our state 
to exercise the Department of Interior to have any BLMs, ATFs, and all of these things, FBI, all of these things are outside the purview of the Constitution. So guess who's public enemy number one? The guy that's saying this. But if you all start focusing and join me in getting this out and becoming a part of the constitutional warrior that I'm hoping to make out of everybody, then when I get killed, because, you know, they, believe me, if they find me cut up in the freezer, don't believe the suicide note, okay? <laughs> so, Republic Review is not any of these two types of conventions, just to, just to make clear, because a lot of people, they see that C word, convention, and they go, oh, I don't know, that's bad. What is the definition of a convention? Does anybody know? It's a process. In engineering, there are conventions, there are processes of manufacturing, there's processes. That's what convention really means. Anyway, in conclusion, all of these slides, like I said at the very beginning, these are going to be available, as well as these videos and so forth. So this is round one of what we have to do. The second presentation, and both of these presentations I've never given to anybody, so this is all kind of new material, so forgive me if I've stumbled or you know, if I've sprayed on you for getting too excited. But anyway, um, are there any questions? Do we want to have microphones? Okay. And while you ask questions, I'm going to prep up the next set of slides so we can do this efficiently. Okay. Well, my question has to do with federal lands okay. that are within the boundaries of the states. Isn't there some, let me see how to phrase this. It, my understanding is that, like for example, Idaho, because Idaho entered the union at a later date, the federal government still has jurisdiction over 70% of the land within the border of Idaho. Is that accurate or would that be inaccurate? Okay, so what you're saying is accurate because the federal government assumes, you know what happens when anybody assumes, but the federal government assumes that they still have the authority over actual sovereign state's property. Show me in the Constitution where they can retain any authority. As a matter of fact, it's in Article 1, Section 8, I think it's subsection 17, that dictates what the federal government can possess land for. And none of it is having to do with departments of forestry, uh, EPA, whatever you want to do. It's literally for very limited scope things. For the seat of government, Washington, D.C., and it says it can only be 10 nautical miles by 10 nautical miles. Virginia took their part back, by the way. Um, but they can have forts, they can have military training, they can have posts, uh, like post offices. Those are the necessary and proper things that they need, but for them to possess forest of a sovereign state is unconstitutional. And the basis that they started making these things, these are all regulations and statutes, once again, that they've gone outside the scope of the Constitution, and they didn't go back to the states and say, hey, can, can we do this? No, they assumed their, uh, the, their supremacy over these things. And they used John Marshall's precedences and they built off of those unconstitutional footings to do all of that. Next question. Uh, there is a, um, there's a movement to amend the Constitution to overturn the Citizens United uh, case, Supreme Court case. So why is an amendment required for that? But was there an amendment uh, that overturned Dred Scott? No. No, and as a matter of fact, um, that's a completely different presentation, if you don't mind, as far as okay, the conventions yeah. and amendments and those types of things, because I would pr probably stand here for a while and talk about some of the things that are going on, my position on the Article 5 convention process and so forth. And I, so, but no, there's been no overturning. And as a matter of fact, just real quick in summary, my position on any constitutional convention or Article 5 process, it's a waste of time. It does not solve the non-compliance. We don't, Madison didn't try to assume a new convention to amend it when they created the Sedition Act. What did he do? He, he basically said these are all violations. He went to the other states and we go, we hope you agree with this, but they didn't. And so what he ended up having to do was their only last bag that they had was called nullification. And they said, we will nullify these laws and we will not enforce them. 
That was the last, you know, act that they could do because the other states would not support the Constitution as they were duty bound to do because and we'll get into this in this, these, everybody takes an oath. If you're a political officer, and there are other offices that require oaths. And so anyway, question over here and then over here, down here. Do, you know, any, do you know anything about the history of executive orders? How they yeah, I, I can tell you that Washington's first executive order, I was probably gonna cover this tonight, or maybe not. If you read his first executive order, it is the recognition for this nation of thanksgiving. And it has nothing to do with pilgrims and Indians and people starving. It had everything to do with recognizing the divine hand of providence in granting them this constitution. So go read that first executive order. But I, in my first book, I do talk about how the president has, has strayed the presidency is straight in using their power in legislating because executive orders are strictly, and Washington did this, as military orders. He gets a law, here comes the law from Congress, okay, and his executive order is the directions of how they're going to enforce this law or enact it. That's all an executive order is supposed to be. But it has grown into acts of legislation. Yes, sir. Yeah, first of all, thank you for coming out and making this presentation. This is great information. Um, I'm going to take a devil's advocate question here for you, okay? Okay, just I'm remember very, who you're going to be, though. I'm a, I'm, a <laughs> I'm a very practical person, and my observation is that the Constitution is widely disregarded already. Yeah. And this seems somewhat academic compared to present-day reality, sure. boots-on-the-ground reality. Okay. So my question would be, how do you get to, you know, from... Um, from where we are today, widely disregarded, you know, nobody cares anymore, it seems, sadly, uh -huh. sadly, right. to yeah. what you're talking about. And is there an interim step or a series of interim steps that have to happen before we can even get to that point where people start waking up and they start actually doing something and following the Constitution for a change? There you go right there. I will be answering that question in more detail than you probably care. If you ate something, I hope I don't give you indigestion. Question, sir. The mic's coming. Okay, here's the mic. Um, I don't think that Washington State would be the state to say, oh, we're going to be the first ones to go against this. And we're from Idaho, and I don't even think Idaho would be it because we're sort of overwhelmed by Boise. What would be the best state to focus on? And if they said, we're going to do it, would I Other right states here. go along with them? Do they have sure. to? Sure, sure. Go ahead. My only question is, I think you're brilliant and I'm loving this and I'm ready to hear the next part. Can you start? <laughs> <laughs> I'm humbled. I, I have no idea why, um, why my hard studies and so forth it really came to the fruition of finding these things. People, I have yet to have a presentation where somebody doesn't come up or make a comment, post comment to an email or something. Why hasn't anybody ever thought of this? I don't know. I, I, if you read my bio, I had classical training in intelligence. I was in the eminent community for a long time. I had 35 years in the intelligence community as an analyst and so forth. And so uh, that classical training has always tried to get me to look at the big picture. Well, what's the big picture? And the big picture was <laughs> they're not following the Constitution. I know all of these things. And then I started putting it together. They called it a contract. So in looking at all the facts, I was able to quickly, again, I don't know why anybody didn't think that we, we had these powers. Madison basically just didn't write it out. Please audit the Constitution when they get too far off track. Because he knew they would. He actually thought that the Constitution was going to die 50 years you know, after 1830, because in 1830 he was uh, talking at the Virginia um, State Constitutional Convention, and he basically made the, a public comment that he goes, he doesn't see this Constitution going another 50 years, because as the state started growing, the interest of the hinterland and the inside or interior of the states were going to be completely different than the west or the east coast. And he said, as this thing grows, he didn't think this Constitution was going to match that. And again, I really don't think Madison, you know, recognized the divine hand of providence of what they really gave us. Uh, he thought that 
it was just more of a mechanical thing. Uh, if you understand Madison, he really was very conscientious in trying not to, you know, create associations between religion. And as a matter of fact, if you understand what what Madison was doing with his executive orders of giving fast and prayer for specific issues to the nation, he rescinded half of those requests of prayer going out. In other words, he asked the nation to pray as they were preparing for something, and then he felt, oh, you know what, I think I might be overstepping my bounds, and he rescinded some of those. And so it, he was very conscientious of trying not to step on people's religious expressions and trying to tell, dictate to them what they had to do. So anyway, I, I probably digressed a little bit in giving you some history, but it is Obama's fault. I'll just let you know that. Anyway, any yeah. other questions or without? Yes. Okay. Uh, when an audit is conducted, you know, there are findings and uh, uh, recommendations that are made for you know, correction of sure. corrective action. Yep. Um, you've talked about the audit review. What do you see as the steps following that? I assume that if this was a management audit. So that's my third book, and I've okay. written it, but I haven't published it yet. Okay. So you're going to keep us in suspense? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I just don't want to present that type of stuff now. Okay. What I, the Constitution actually has all of this. The Constitution has the forces of what the states have, and to be able to, you know, implement, you know, their authority once again. And, but I'll get into that again when, I'm, when we're there. What I want to do is just get this out, this concept of being able to audit and stepping forward into um, taking the authority of the states and or the authority of the Constitution by the states back again and becoming a true constitutional republic. Okay? All right. Well, uh, one more question. I, yes, sir. Well, one problem I like to suggest is uh, some counties have sheriffs that have gone back to federal uh, training on what the Constitution means, and they might not like what's being said and might want to want to stop it. Oh, I can guarantee you that if um, my wife is very, very concerned, I go by GR. There's a reason for that, and. Um, it's not just those people. I'm really not too concerned about those people. I'm really more concerned about the people that will recognize that their billion dollar, trillion dollar industry, banking and so forth, will be truly impacted and affected. That we are actually going to take this country back by doing this. And they will lose their control over this country. If you, if you garner that, you know, as long as this message moves forward and it doesn't silence tonight, and it continues if everybody else tells an audience of 50 people and keeps going because the whole point of creating these slides, I'll take this break right now and saying this, the whole point of creating these slides and what I'm going to do next is kind of create the script so that people can get up and present these, go to another county, so I can't be everywhere. This is going to spread like wildfire if this starts moving. I I can only be in so many places, so what I have to do is create constitutional warriors, and I need 100 in every state to be able to work in different counties and to be able to put the appropriate pressure where, it's a, where it needs to be applied at that given point in time. And so, I, I truly am aware of what the threats are, and <laughs> my wife has pointed this out to me. And so, I, uh, I'm not too concerned with people that are teaching federalism. I mean, they're a little closer at least, right? They're a little closer than the, the progressives of democracy and that we can do anything that we want to as long as we get the right votes and have a mob rule. So let me move forward. So what powers does the Constitution grant to the states? That's, that's a live, anybody know what the answer of that is? All powers not delegated to the federal government are granted inherently to the states. Okay, so when people want to know, well, they don't have this power. Absolutely, we have this power. Is it in the Constitution? Did, what's that? Well, so that's kind of an implication, but the, the power of auditing the Constitution, who has the power? If it's not in the Constitution, that means that the states have that power. Yes, sir. You got to turn yourself on. You, you say granted. The Constitution doesn't grant powers to the states. The states 
set those powers. No, I understand that. Okay. I understand Granted that. Like but the, but most granted. people understand that the Constitution does grant powers to the federal government. They're delegated powers. So I get these constitutional organizations. Well, where is that granted? You know that the states can do that, and I have to answer that question with well, so what powers are granted to the states in the Constitution? Zero. Those are, this, those are the powers, as a matter of fact, Nicholson said this, I, I, I give you a little story. Right after Madison spoke, uh, June 8th, 1788, Nichols got up in f supporting the Federalists and he basically put it like this. If I had a thousand acres and I delegated and gave and granted and bequeathed Mr. Christina a portion of those, do I have to re-survey my property to basically give myself a new deed? No. I still possess the property that I keep. I still possess the powers, responsibilities, and roles that I have not given up to Mr. Christina. And it's the same application. And I think Nichols really articulated well in the Virginia ratification debates. Okay, so if we can get one state, this is what we got to do. We just need to get one state to start the initiatory process because then it gets out of GR's hands. It gets out of me being able to go out and give this message because now we've got a state that becomes the beacon. Does this make sense? And so this state's going to call upon all. So here's the trillion dollar question. How do we get there from here? I'm going to tell you. What's that? Go to Oklahoma. Go to Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, so... Here's, here's the big secret. State legislatures possess the power. When the ch Constitution needs to be changed, and as a matter of fact, Madison and Jefferson talk about this in the Kentucky, Virginia, and in the Virginia's follow-on in 1880s, or 18, I always say 1880, 1800 resolution, Madison clearly states that the states and the legislative bodies are duty-bound and obligated to step in. So if you go and read these resolutions, what Madison and Jefferson are saying is so powerful, it's just amazing. But the state legislatures are the guys, the guys that were in here, these three guys that stood up here. They're the ones that are supposed to be doing this. So it is their job to ensure compliance and it's obviously something that they've not been doing and that they've been as well asleep. So what is it our job? to wake them up. We've got to wake them up and we've got to call them out. And I'll get to how and why. So how can we convince state legislatures to do their job in protecting us from federal tyranny? Well, as I've just quickly educated you on the Constitution, the whole fact of it's a, it's a, it's a contract, that we're the stakeholders, and that we have these powers, we have to educate them that they possess this power. They don't even know they have this power because the education system didn't tell them. It's been very nefarious in how they have taught our constitutional powers and roles that the federal government is powerful in all things. And everybody believes this. I'm telling you, the Constitution and the framers say absolutely differently. And so once we convince them to take the initiative, then the ball starts rolling on the floor of that state assembly, right? because now they're going to be getting involved. And so we have two methods of motivation, right? Everybody understands the stick and the carrot, right? Okay, there's our motives. How are we going to use those? Well, before I get into that, I need to basically point out that there is one battlefield. And that primarily is here in the states. It's not in D.C. The most important battlefield for us in this room is this county. People to the north, it's in that county. And Olympia. It, we need to take this battlefield from our counties to Olympia and demand that they do their job. So we need two approaches to do this. And these happen simultaneously. And sometimes they can happen, so they can first start with a coalition. And as a matter of fact, I'm hoping that maybe these states that I'll talk about later, a coalition in Washington, Olympia, Washington, they actually start talking to some of these other legislatures in other states going, you know, you guys could be doing this. And that's how it gets rolling. So just like the Revolutionary War, these 
leaders actually acted upon themselves. They didn't have this big election. They didn't have to educate the electorate and say, you know, do we think we want to revolt. What do you guys think about this? They were a republic at the time, and they were the representatives of the people, and because they were, they were empowered to make those decisions. That's one of the reasons why we actually had a revolutionary war, because they led and acted. Had they waited and said, well, we got to do a poll and survey, like typical politics, we'd probably still be a part of the crown in the commonwealth, right? So we don't have the time right now to really go into um, going through the election process, or I should say the educational process for everybody, and I'll get into this as far as educating, because people will get educated on this. But they didn't have the time at that time, and we don't have the time, and we have people that are empowered just like them. So the, there's no difference between what they did for the Revolutionary War and what we can do and what we need to do now. So again, educating all the leaders, and this is literally, when I say all the leaders, I mean the state party leaders. Guess what? There's a Constitution Party, and the Constitution Party chair lives in this area, and he actually supports my executive summary. Hopefully I get with him that he can take this at the party level to the national level. We need Susan Hutchinson of the Republican Party to take the time to read this. I know it takes an hour or so to read my executive summary and all the citations, but take the time to read this and get her on board and get all the party leadership as well as our politicians. And so what we have to do is get them, the politicians, to start building this coalition and network of those who are willing to support the Constitution. Motivating and uniting these leaders to me is very easy. Again, the stick and carrot thing. These leaders are serving for a reason. They have political motives, and some of these are noble and some of them aren't. But the point is that we want them to sign a petition. We want every, I want every elected official, and so far the elected officials that I talk to, such as Ed Pace, Rob, Rob, I, he hasn't read it yet, but uh, those who have read it actually are on board and they want to sign the petition. So I ha I'm batting a thousand right now. I haven't found a politician that has come up with this lame excuse that they won't do it. But it's not just signing the petition, I need them to be advocates.